gets a lot of credit for popularizing um, and profoundly influencing uh, children into math and into science and logic and uh, uh, through his books. And his books feature a lot of classical characters that ended up in other books and in movies and uh, in other literature. Uh, right? So we see uh, uh, the caterpillar and uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, right? There's the uh, Mad Hatter, the Cheshire Cat. Right, uh, the Griffin, uh, Walrus, and the Carpenter, the Red Queen. These are all right out of his books. These are original etchings from his original uh, editions of his original books. Right, and uh, the entire book, actually, the through the Looking Glass, is is basically a big chess game, and these uh, characters are chess pieces: the Red Queen, the White Knight. So the whole story actually is uh, an evolving chess game. How many knew that actually? And you can follow it. It's actually a, a, a grandmaster level uh, chess game evolving as a children's story. Of course, children probably won't quite completely appreciate all the nuances of that. But there's many other aspects of these books that involve very sophisticated math and logic and uh, scientific inquiries and studies on semantics. Uh, here's Tweedledee and Tweedledum, uh, the Red Queen, the Walsh and the Carpenter, um, Humpty Dumpty sitting on a wall with his great fall and all that. Um, the, the White Knight uh, talking to Alice. And many of the passages are like master lessons in semantics and logic. Um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But it had a tremendous influence on all generations that came after that. Millions of kids reading those books over the ages, over the last century and a half, have been encouraged to go into math and logic and science because um, it just intrigues them as well as entertain them. It, it was made into movies many times. These are just 15 of the most you know, common uh, Hollywood renditions of these books as, as movies. Um, and there were many others. And uh, most recently it was uh, uh, Through the Looking Glass and uh, Alice in Wonderland when, uh, by, directed by Tim Burton with Johnny Depp playing the Mad Hatter. How many have seen that? that those movies made a billion dollars each. And this is 150 years after he wrote the, the novels, which is pretty amazing. Let me show you an example of what I mean by master lessons in uh, logic and semantics. So this is a conversation from the book of Alice and the White Knight. So the knight says, uh, let me sing you a song. And Alice says, is it long? And he says, it's long, but it's very beautiful. Uh, either it brings tears into people's eyes, or else, or else what, Alice says, or else it doesn't. Right? And he says, the name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. And Alice says, oh, that's the name of the song, is it? And he says, no, that's, that's a different thing altogether. The name, that's what the name is called. The name really is the aged, aged man. And he says, then I ought to have said, that's what the song is called. And he says, no, that's quite another thing. The song is called some other thing, ways and means. And he says, well, what is the song then? And he says, oh, the song really is a fourth thing here in green, a sitting on a gate. So... You have to almost draw it out to see what this all means. But, you know, but here it alludes to a logical disjunction, law of the excluded middle. Uh, but more importantly, he says the song is a sitting on a gate, your color coded green. But the song is called Ways and Means. But that's not what the song is, that's what the song is called. Right? But the name of the song is something else altogether. It's the aged, aged man. And the name is called Haddock's Eyes. So there's the song, there's what the song is called. There's the name of the song, and that's what the name is called. Because everything can have a name, including a name itself. Right? So when I say, you know, I am Gabriel, I am not Gabriel. Gabriel is my name, but that's not what I am. I am this collection of atoms and proteins and so on that make me up. But so, you know, you start splitting hairs about semantics, and you learn to think and speak and convey yourself much more precisely than before and avoid all sorts of confusions and have more insights as to what's going on, really, uh, what it is you're talking about. Um, so, so it's really you know, quite, quite amazing. He's, he's really po talking about pointers here and pointer dereferencing. In computer science, this happens all the time. A pointer is not the object. It's something that points to the object. And the object may be another pointer that then points to something else. And you have to dereference things. You know, so programs can be understood as, as in, in terms of semantics and denotational semantics in particular. And this predates programming by over 100 years. You know, so that's, that's pretty good. And so when you start showing this to six-year-old kids, it makes them kind of 
begin to appreciate you know, fine nuances of logic and math and semantics and philosophy and science in general. And uh, many of them were, were driven towards science as a result. And that's, that's a good thing. That's great. So he, he helped create you know, in many generations of young scientists, mathematicians, and logicians, and later computer scientists. Uh, any questions about any of this? This is, um, you know, so, so adults can reread these books, and this time with an eye towards all the cleverness between the lines and all the hidden meanings and, you know, the uh, scientific and mathematical logical allusions, and it's a whole new experience now. Uh, but, uh, but this is just a typical excerpt. This is not an exception. That's a rule, this book. Um, this, this pair of books, actually. It's full of these uh, interesting uh, insights and uh, observations. Right? Uh, so, you know, semantics is, is a very deep field, actually. You know, so here's an example in this cartoon. You know, it says, semantics, a classroom in which meanings are discussed. And here it clarifies it semantically. It says, actually, this is just a door. The classroom is on the other side of the door, you know, just to be correct. And in this class, you know, the, the deeper you go into semantics, and, you know, the, the, the less you'll make type errors, for example. And we've already seen lots and lots of opportunities to make type errors and, you know, uh, calls of warning to, to, to avoid these, these kind of type errors and semantic errors and so on. And there's entire societies to this day that study his work and its uh, impact on the world and on, you know, and on kids and on science and on mathematics and so on. Uh, the Alice system is named after him, the one that Randy Pouch developed at Carnegie Mellon that introduces five- and six-year-olds into programming. How many heard of that system? And it's done a lot of good. A lot of little tiny kids, have, very young kids, were, learned how to program using this system. And it's, uh, it's very visual, and uh, it's designed to be able to tell stories and make storyboards. And, uh, you know, it's quite, quite interesting. Uh, so it's hard to overestimate his impact on... Uh, on modern technology and on computer science in particular. Of course, Cantor, uh, we already know the stuff that he did, so I'll just kind of breeze through that, right? We talked about the infinite hotels before, one-to-one -one correspondences, right? We talked about diagonalization and uh, dovetailing. So I'll just kind of fast forward through this, right? Here's the dovetailing through the rational numbers, showing that they're countable. And then, of course, you can diagonalize over the reals, showing that the reals are uncountable, right? That's a classical diagonalization due to Cantor. So I think we covered all that, so I'll just skip through it. Uh, we talked about non-existence proofs, showing that you're not a millionaire. It's hard to do. In fact, today, Rice's theorem is an example of one of those. We proved that you know, no algorithm exists for an uncountable number of different problems couched as properties of languages. So that's one of those proofs that you're not a millionaire. That's hard to come by. Talked about Cantor sets, right? So I'll breeze through that. Uh, did we talk about Russell? Probably not. Okay. So uh, around the era of um, Cantor, uh, Russell and uh, his co-author uh, Whitehead uh, uh, published Principia Mathematica, which basically axiomatized all of mathematics on the back of set theory. Basically, they show that set theory is enough to represent any mathematical field and theorems and results that you want. So all of mathematics would be done strictly and purely as set theory, which was an amazing revelation. In other words, he showed that set theory is at the foundation of all math. It's like the set theory is like the machine language of mathematics, just like the machine language is sort of the bedrock of you know, programming and computer sciences, what happens on the silicon with transistors um, at, uh, at the gate level. So he kind of reduced all of math to set theory. Uh, it was kind of surprising that's even possible. And, and it was a monumental effort. It took hundreds of pages, you know, probably a thousand pages or more to do this. It profoundly, he, this guy profoundly influenced uh, math and philosophy. And uh, he mentored Wittgenstein, influenced Gödel, uh, And we'll talk about Gödel separately. Uh, originated so-called Russell's paradox. And he also incidentally won a Nobel Prize in literature in the 50s. But that's you know, uh, probably not even his biggest achievement. Uh, so here are some books uh, by Russell. You can see the number of and, and, and breadth of fields that he investigated, including education and logic and organization and religion and uh, the mind, uh, of course, geometry, morals. He wrote about a lot of different 
subjects. You know, here are some more books by Russell, again showing the breadth and depth of his uh, inquiries and uh, investigations. Uh, these are not books about Russell. These are books by Russell. He wrote all of these things. And I'm just showing you, you know, the top 50 or 60 of them. Uh, I'm not even showing you all of them. I uh, talked about Western philosophy and governments and crime and wars and morality and uh, is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so here's a page from Princip Principia Mathematica, just to show you what it kind of looks like when you start to axiomatize all of mathematics using set theory. Pretty cryptic notation, a lot of very detailed derivation. And this is page number 379 of volume 1, and it says, from this proposition, it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. So it took him you know, over 300 pages just to get to the fact and to be able to prove using set theory only that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. And, and he's not even proving it. He says later this will be done when we have addition defined. And then he goes on to define addition. And this is page 86 into the next volume. And finally, sure enough, he proves that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 here. And he says the above proposition is occasionally useful. Uh, that's kind of an understatement. Uh, so, and the rest of it looks pretty much like that. Uh, very technical, kind of a tour de force uh, through all of math basically reducing it to set theory. Uh, pretty amazing, actually. Uh, and then, of course, there's websites that do this mechanically now, automatically. You type in some proposition, like 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, in the logic, in the symbolic logic that he uses, and it gives you the whole derivation, however long it is. And so there's websites that kind of implement his Principia Mathematica as a live kind of uh, interactive proof type system where you can click on these things and get uh, more derivations and so on, and, and go deep into that, into that stuff if you're so inclined. So these few web pages actually uh, implement, you know, dynamically what we just saw in his in his text, right? And he talks about he talked about world peace. Here he is winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. Alongside him, another guy actually with UVA affiliation won a Nobel Prize in Literature. Also, anybody recognize this guy or know who he is? He's a famous author won a literature Nobel Prize around the 1950s, and he was had a UVA affiliation with uh, Faulkner. Faulkner, the, the famous author. Um, so he gets a lot of credit. Here he is marching against, you know, here he is marching uh, against uh, nuclear proliferation, you know, and, and, and back in the 50s it was almost a, you know, heretical thing to do, right? People got arrested and interrogated for being pacifists and anti-war and so on. Even today, you know, there's a lot of, they get a lot of flack, you know, people who oppose war and, uh, and, and speak out against it. It's interestingly enough, you know, after all this time has passed, you think we, you know, we would have know, bet know better by now. And here's a LP record, a vinyl record put out by Big Al and, and Bernard Russell, Einstein and Russell together, speaking about how terrible war is and how the world should do away with wars and, and stop this craziness about fighting and war and, and, and death, and death and destruction, especially when nuclear weapons are involved. And this was in the 40s and, and 50s. Um, and here we are 70 years later, and we still have lots of wars all over the place. So you know, they tried, uh, but uh, they didn't get a lot of traction there, unfortunately. Certainly not from politicians. Uh, he has a big moon crater named after him. And he famously said, most people will sooner die than think. In fact, they do so. Uh, he wasn't. Um, always very uh, optimistic about human nature and the trajectory of the human race. Uh, famously, he pioneered so-called Russell's paradox. And uh, he basically showed that naive set theory has some self-contradiction. So consider the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. So T is a set that is not a member of itself. Because a set can be a member of itself or not a member of itself, right? So, for example, you can have a set that looks like, uh, call it, I don't know, S being the set of the number one, all of the integers as the next element, and itself as the third element. And it's kind of a recursive definition. That's OK. You can do that. And once you're comfortable you know, having sets containing other sets, including their own selves as elements, you can form or at least try to form the set of all sets that do not contain themselves in an element. So this set contains itself as an element. Other sets don't, like the empty set or, or the reals or the rationals. They do not contain themselves as an element. 
And so what if you can form the set of all sets that do not contain themselves as an element and ask yourself, does it contain itself as an element? So if it contains itself as an element, it can't contain itself as an element and vice versa. Because if it doesn't contain itself as an element, it satisfies the condition here for inclusion. And once it satisfies this condition, it must be included in itself as an element. But if it doesn't contain itself as an element, uh, it must contain itself as an element. And if it does contain itself as an element, it can't because it doesn't satisfy this condition. So it contains itself if and only if it doesn't contain itself. So that's, that's a paradox. You can't have it both ways. And that's a very deep paradox. It's hard to fix this. It's, it's, it's really impossible to fix this with axiomatic systems as far as we know. Uh, right? uh, you can couch this paradox in other more colloquial terms. So you can say there's a village where there's a barber who shaves exactly those who do not shave themselves. And the question is, does this barber shave itself, himself or not? Because he only shaves those that do not shave himself. So if he doesn't shave himself, he must shave himself. And if he shaves himself, he cannot shave himself because he only shaves those who do not shave themselves. So he neither shaves himself nor not shave himself. That's a paradox again, very much like this set uh, version of the paradox. They all kind of have the same flavor to them. Right? Consider this, this assertion. This sentence is false. This sentence is talking about itself. So if it's true, what it says is true, but what it says is false. So if it's true, it's false. But if it's false, then the opposite of what it says is true. It says it's false, so it must be true. So if it's false, it's true. If it's true, it's false. So it's neither false nor true, this sentence. Right? Or you can say, I am lying. If I say to you, I am lying right now, if, if I'm lying, then I'm telling you the truth. But if I'm telling you the truth, I am lying. Because so, what I say is true, and I'm saying I'm lying. So if I say I am lying, I'm neither lying nor not lying at the same time. Again, a contradiction. And there's many other ways to say it. Is the answer to this question no? It can't be no, it can't be yes, if you think about it. The smallest positive integer not describable in 20 words or less. That's a finite description. Because some integers are describable in 20 words or less, and some are not. right? Because 20 words or less is all it's just finite descriptions of less than 20 words, or less than, say, 50 characters, or whatever it is. Uh, and every set of integers has the smallest positive, every positive set of integers has a smallest value, right? They're, they're well ordered. But if you say the smallest positive integer not describable in 20 words or less, you would think that's a valid description of a unique integer that's well described, but this description itself is less than 20 words. So again, a paradox. Uh, so it's hard to get away. There's many guises and versions of this paradox, both colloquially, mathematically, scientifically, algebraically, logically. Uh, it's hard to get away from that, actually. In fact, impossible. There's Star Trek episodes where Captain Kirk, you know, uses Russell's paradox to get a, you know, some some uh, android to go into an infinite loop and until smoke comes out of the head, and then and then foiled his attempt to to take over the Enterprise. Uh, most of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. How many have seen these old Star Trek episodes? All right, that's okay. Uh, trust me on this. It's, 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 it's a cute one, the reason you, Russell's Paradox. Uh, one of my favorite depictions of Russell's Paradox is this cartoon that's Pinocchio saying, my nose will now grow. And as you know, Pinocchio nose grows if and only if he's lying. Right? Uh, so if he says, my nose will grow now, and he's telling the truth, what he says must be true, and so he knows it's supposed to grow. But if he's telling the truth, it's not supposed to grow because he's not lying. But if he's lying, his nose will grow, but he says, my nose will grow, so, but, so he's not lying because his nose is growing, but he only grows when he's lying. But if he says that, he's telling the truth. So he's neither lying nor telling the truth at the same time. Again, Russell's paradox. Uh, and as many, many other ways to express this paradox, it's very ubiquitous. It's hard to get rid of. Yeah. Yeah, so, so she's talking about the law of the excluded middle. So something must be either true or false. So yeah, we assume that it's either true or false, these things. So uh, lying and telling the truth are the, two op the only two options, and they're opposite options. A set, you know, an element being a member of a set or not a member of the set are the two options for the set version. There's no 
halfway being a member or it's being slightly a member but not really you know i mean member set membership is either you're in or you're out of the set it's very crisp you know there's only two options law of the excluded middle but yeah it depends on that um, but then all of logic depends on that true false yes no all of computer science depends on binary values true false yes no zero one there's nothing in between right between zero and a one uh, so uh, people have tried to do away with the paradox uh, with this so-called Russell's paradox many different times in different ways even John von Neumann once tried to re-axiomatize all of set theory while avoiding this paradox and he didn't he didn't succeed actually um, any other questions or comments about Russell or that paradox in fact that paradox is a subtle form of of diagonalization uh, how many can smell diagonalization here yeah Remember diagonalization, you go down and you do the opposite of what everything on a diagonal is, and then you come up with something that's not there, and that's a contradiction. It's, it's not there, but it needs to be there, but it's not there. And that's actually um, a form of diagonalization, this paradox, if you think about it you know, abstractly enough. So a mathematician called Hardy uh, wrote a so-called mathematician's apology, famous um, kind of autobiography and uh, he made many contributions to math but one of his main contributions by his own admission is that he discovered the mathematician Ramanujan and Srinivasa Ramanujan uh, lived in the early uh, uh, did his work in the early 1900s late 1800s early 1900s he was an Indian mathematician who was very very poor and he got a hold of uh, a book of theorems basically it was uh, just a, a glossary of theorems, known theorems, but without proofs. He just listed one theorem after the other. And that's the only book he could afford, the only book he saw for years growing up as a child. And he memorized it and he thought about it and he thought that's how mathematics is done. You just think about something that's true and you just write it down. You don't have to prove it or anything like that. And he kept writing down other theorems that he thought were true in addition to the hundreds of ones that he saw in this big glossary of theorems. And it turns out many of them were also true. He just never thought that you need to prove things. You can just decide that they're true and write them down. He thought that's how mathematics is done. And so he wrote to um, uh, Hardy and uh, other famous mathematicians in Cambridge. And uh, he sent a letter saying, you know, here are a couple of hundred theorems that I've proven. And I'd like to, this is a sample of my work. And I'd like to come study with you, you know, mathematics in England. This was turn of the century, 1890, you know, 1900, turn of the century, um, England. And they got this letter, and about half of his theorems that he wrote down that he said he invented were already known in the West. And so they thought it was some sort of a, cr of a prank. Uh, but then they looked at the other half, and those were not known to them to be true. But they couldn't prove that they were false either. They just have never seen those before. And a good quarter of them, not only they haven't seen before or were able to disprove or prove, they've never even seen the form of the theorem. The formulas were so esoteric, they've never seen anything of that form before in their lives. So they realize if it's a mathematical prank, it's an extremely sophisticated prank. Uh, it turns out that all of these things were true. And he was one of the most amazing and prolific mathematicians of all time. Uh, this entire uh, journals and, and societies and conferences devoted to his work a hundred plus years later. Um, in fact, here's a conference from just a few years ago. Uh, this is from uh, 2009, uh, devoted to one of his so-called lost notebooks. Um, that that uh, you know he he proved so he, he wrote down so many true theorems, thousands of them, most of them without proof. And even to this day, we haven't proven all of them. We you know all of science and mathematics haven't proven all of them. And there are people who made a career, including my brother, who's a uh, pure mathematician. My brother's PhD thesis in math was proving a few of the Ramanujan identities that he never, that he just wrote down, and nobody could prove or disprove for all these, you know, for over a century. Uh, there's a famous story about many famous stories, but one of them is Hardy was visiting Ramanujan in, in the hospital when Ramanujan was sick; he was in poor health most of his life, and to cheer him up. Hardy told Ramanujan that the taxi cab number on the way to the hospital was 1729 and said that, you know, that number is not particularly interesting 
kind of a dull number. And Ramanujan immediately replied, no, it's actually a very interesting number because it's the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in exactly two ways. Uh, he just happened to know that. And that's how intimate he was with numbers and integers. You know, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. And by the way, uh, you know, th these are Fermat's near misses, so-called, right? Yeah, so here's the expression of this in, in cubes in two different ways. And if it was this cube plus this cube is equal to this cube, that can't be by Fermat's last theorem. But if you add one to it, now it's an equality. So it's kind of a Fermat near miss. There's a whole now theory about Fermat's near misses uh, for higher exponents than, than two. And this has become the, known as the Hardy-Ramanujan number, 1729. Anyway, there's, there's, there's many anecdotes like that about him and his work. Let me show you some of the examples when I say esoteric theorems that he wrote down. Let me just show you what they look like, you know, which, which really amazed and uh, shocked mathematicians in the West when they saw it. He came up with this identity here. 1 over pi is equal to this. Remember, this is, a, this is 50 years or more before computers were even invented. This is not an approximation to 1 over pi. It's equal to 1 over pi, precisely. And you know, look at this, the size of these digits, you know, these this, this, this numbers. You know, 396 to the 4K, an infinite sum over factorials. And you know, it's, it's really amazing that this is even true, never mind that, that, he was, you know, that he actually came up with this and realized that it was true. Even today, it'd be very hard to prove things like that. Here's another one involving the the gamma function. Uh, here's another infinite, you know, infinite, uh, fr you know, fraction, continued fractions. Here are some other formulas that he, he invented. And these are identities. This is not approximations. These are, these are identities, pure and simple. And the movie Good Will Hunting is actually based on, on him, the uh, character of uh, Matt Damon playing this, you know, brilliant mathematician at MIT who's also a janitor is actually modeled after Ramanujan. How many have seen the movie, actually? So how many knew that it was Ramanujan? Now you know. Uh, so him and Ben Affleck who wrote the script, that was their big break in Hollywood, early 90s. Robin Williams you know, won an uh, Oscar for his uh, role in it. And uh, it's all based on Ramanujan. There's a TV show called Numbers, actually, where a couple of FBI guys, one of them is a mathematician, they solve crime by using math and algorithms. Yeah, that's pretty cool, They're using algorithms to solve crime. I, people actually do this now. And uh, one of the characters is called Ramanujan, actually, and she's a woman. They made her a woman for kind of a gender twist. But, uh, but the main character is based on Ramanujan himself, actually, even though that's her name in the show. Uh, so Frank Ramsey uh, contributed to mathematics, to game theory, to set theory, uh, to logic. He generalized the pigeonhole principle into something that we now call Ramsey theory. Uh, and Ramsey theory is basically uh, an area of graph theory, very profound, deep area. He was Wittgenstein's PhD advisor, and he influenced George von Neumann and many others. They all died young, by the way. Ramanujan died when, before he was around 30. Uh, Ramsey died at age 26. Um, but they did some amazing stuff. So the pigeonhole principle, you already know what it is. Uh, you know, we got some mileage out of it, for example, when we showed uh, uh, the pumping theorem, right? Remember that? Uh, regular languages have a pumpable, so we use the pumping theorem to show that there's a string larger than the number of states in the machine by the, pump, by the pigeonhole principle. Uh, you know, some state must repeat, but that's, that's the pigeonhole principle. If you have more pigeons and holes, some pigeons must bunk up and share a hole or a pigeonhole. And it's not true if you have less pigeons and holes, necessarily. So basically what it says is no one-to-one -one function from a finite set to a smaller finite set. Now, Ramsey generalized the heck out of this. So uh, first of all, the, the first more obvious generalization, if you have n objects placed in m containers, then at least one container must hold at least n over m ceiling objects. It's not just n and n plus 1. It's m and n in general. And basically, at least one container must hold less than or equal to n over m floor. So that's a little more general than the classical form of n and n plus 1. But, he, but there's a much more general versions that I'll talk to you in a minute about. But first, let's, let's solve this problem that's in one of the problem sets. I think we, we gave it on the, in the first problem set. Uh, not the homework, but the, the actual uh, problem set, or the second problem set, maybe one of those. Uh, show that any group of six people contains either three mutual friends or three mutual strangers. Um, so in other words, in any graph of six nodes, there's a monochromatic triangle. 
So how do you show that? So first of all, it's not true for five. So if you have a graph for a group of five people, so uh, friends are represented with blue edges, uh, strangers are represented by red edges, and all, every, all, the, all the edges are there. They're either colored red or blue. So here there's no monochromatic triangle. There's no triangle that's all blue or triangle that's all red. So that's a counterexample of five. So six is the smallest number for which this is true. The question is, how do you prove something like this? Right? So this is an example of Ramsey theory. So you can use a brute force approach. You can say, OK, list all graphs of size six nodes, count, paint them in all possible ways. And that is the problem is there's a lot of them. There's, there's 78 different modular isomorphisms, you know, 78 different you know, friends, strangers kind of graphs with six nodes. And you, you, you can't even be sure that you've listed them all and you didn't miss any. And you can show that none of them contain a mono, that all of them contain a monochromatic triangle, either a red triangle or a blue triangle, three mutual friends or three mutual strangers. Uh, so it's, this kind of a proof is just brute force and not very satisfying. It doesn't generalize and doesn't even convince you that it's right because it, you know, it's hard to see that you didn't miss any cases and so on. So you need a more elegant approach. So here's how you do it using kind of Ramsey theory arguments. You'd say, OK, without also generality, consider one of the nodes. And at least three of these neighbors of this node, because all five are neighbors, at least three of them will have the same color, right? all blue or all red, because every, no every edge is either blue or red. There's no exceptions. Right? So by the pigeonhole principle, at least three are blue or three are red, because you can't have two blue and two red because it has five neighbors, right? So they have to add up to five or more, so at least two or at least three must be of the same color, blue, without also generality assume it's blue, because the, the red and the blue are interchangeable. You can call them color one and color two, you know, to say blue and red. So at least three of them must be of the same color. How, how many believe that, understand that? Okay. Next, look at this edge here between these two guys. This edge. If you're going to avoid a monochromatic triangle, this edge cannot be blue, because if it was blue, you'd have this monochromatic blue triangle, which you're trying to avoid. So deliberately, let's make it not blue. Otherwise, the proof will be over. So let's make it red. Okay. And once you make that red, let's look at this other edge here. And this edge can't be blue either. Otherwise, you'd have a monochromatic triangle right there. And if you do, the proof will be over. So let's deliberately avoid monochromatic triangle right there and make that edge red on purpose, deliberately to avoid a blue triangle there. Once you make that red, look at that final edge there. And that edge can't be blue, because if it was blue, again, you'll have a monochromatic triangle there. And so make that edge red also. Again, we're trying to avoid a monochromatic triangle. And all of a sudden, we have a monochromatic red triangle right there. And so the point is, you cannot avoid a monochromatic triangle if you have six nodes where all the edges are painted in one or, one or two colors. Um, how many get this proof? Okay. And this is a lot better proof, a lot more elegant, a lot more insightful than this proof right here, enumerating all possibilities and then wondering you know, if you missed any, and then tediously going through each and every one. And that's just brute force, not very illuminating. This is short, succinct, tells the story, proves the point. And uh, you can generalize this to, to bigger graphs and to more colors. And people have, and Ramsey have done this. And he proved them you know, a very general theorem. And also, so, so 6 now is said to be the Ramsey number of R33, the Ramsey R33 number. So it means that if you have a group of three, um, that if you have a group of six people, at least you have you have must have a subgroup of at least three friends or at least three three uh, um, strangers. Okay. Now you can also prove using similar technique that if you have a group of eighteen people, you have you must have at least four mutual friends and four mutual strangers. In other words, if you paint a graph with two colors, every edge gets one of two colors, color A or color B. You have a four clique of one color or a four clique of another color. That's what I mean by four mutual strings. So a three clique is just a triangle. A four clique is all six edges, right? Among four nodes. The clique is a complete graph on, on four on four nodes. And in general, you can prove much more general theorem that for any pair of positive integers, B and R, 
there exists a least positive integer r of b of r, the Ramsey number, such that any complete graph over that many vertices will have either a blue or a red monochromatic clique of size b or of size r. It's unavoidable. And just the fact that this number always exists is not obvious. Maybe there's a way of constructing a very big graph on many nodes with two colors such that there won't be any cliques at all of the same color. Maybe, maybe, maybe that, that was true. That's not true. And you can prove this. It's not obvious at all. And another way of looking at Ramsey theory is six order among chaos. Right? So in t in even if you paint the nodes and edges of a graph random colors and try to get away from any kind of order, any kind of complete clique of monochromatic you know, uh, nature, um, it's very highly ordered. If you try to avoid order and, and introduce only chaos and disorder, you can't do that. Uh, order must appear somewhere, unavoidably. You know, so, so it's a way of saying that you can always find order among chaos. If the chaos is large enough, there'll be some order there, necessarily. It won't all be random and chaotic and, and patternless, right? which is another interesting statement. You know, it's, uh, it's not obvious at all that that's true in general. You think there's a way to scramble things up so that there'll be no patterns whatsoever. Well, this says you can't, in this sense at least. And in many other senses, that's true too, not just this sense. Right, so you can always find regularity among you know, disorderliness and chaos and randomness. Right? Uh, in pi, there's a point after a few hundred digits where the digits are 999999. There's six nines in a row. Just so happens. Of course, the rest of the are, are not nines and there are many other things. So the, the pigeonhole principle is a very special case of this generalized kind of Ramsey theory. And there's many other known, or at least some other known Ramsey numbers. So we just proved with this uh, monochromatic triangle among six people that R33 is 6. And 6 is the exact number for R33. That's what we proved here. Uh, it's no more, no less than 6. Because 5, we already show an example, a counterexample of 5 that is no monochromatic triangle. And 6 is 5, so for 7 it's true also. So the exact Ramsey number for R33 is, is 6. We know a few other exact numbers. For R44, it's 18. That's We just you know, stated that theorem without proof on the previous slide. For R54, it's 25. Right? For R37, it's 23, and so on. And these are ranges. So we know for R77, for example, that the smallest graph for which a clique of size 7 strangers or 7 friends is unavoidable, the smallest graph size is between 205 and 540. Okay. So, uh, and we don't know how to close that range. We just have this. And for larger numbers, we have even larger ranges that is, you know, next to impossible to close. Right? So, um, um, Paul Erdos, the famous mathematician, uh, uh, one of the best, probably the best mathematician of the 20th century, said, if an alien force more powerful than us landed on Earth and demanded to know the value of R55, which is known to be between 43 and 49, but we don't know where in that range it is. We just know that's the upper and lower bounds. If they demand that we know that we give them this value, otherwise they will destroy us, maybe we can marshal all of our computers, all of our mathematicians, and maybe try to close this gap between 43 and 49 and actually come up with a value. That'll, that's probably all humanity will be doing for the next few years in terms of <laughs> its resources. But if instead they ask for R66, uh, he said we should uh, try really hard to destroy them first. Uh, there's uh, almost no point in trying to figure that one out, even if our lives depended on it. That's how hard these problems are. Uh, so. Uh, you can generalize it to multiple colors, like you can talk about colors of blue, green, and, you know, blue, red, and green, or yellow. And for R333, it's 17. So if you have a graph of 17 nodes, and you paint every edge one of three colors, you, you, you cannot avoid a monochromatic triangle. But now it takes 17 nodes, not just six, because you're dealing with three colors, so you have more, more leeway. Uh, for extra credit, prove that R333 is 17. And the fact that I'm giving you for extra credit means it's not that hard. To, it's not that much harder to prove than, 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 than R33 being 6. Like we just proved that a few slides ago. Uh, but it's interesting. And then you can talk about hypergraphs where edges have many 
nodes, not just two nodes. How many heard of hypergraphs? So hypergraphs, every edge is a subset of nodes, not just a subset being two, but you have three nodes, four node, node edges, and so on. Uh, and you can generalize Ramsey theory to hypergraphs and to infinite graphs even. Um, the bottom line is complete disorder is impossible, is what kind of the, one of the messages of this theory is. And uh, that brings us to, uh, to David Hilbert, and we'll go deeper into, into his stuff um, next time. Any, any other thoughts or comments? Um, you know, we'll try to break a little early today. We'll try to you know, stay more on time, uh, not go over, over time too much unless absolutely necessary. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm kind of going back into history, giving you the long arc, how we got here from abacus to iPhones. We already covered a few luminaries, like start with the Greeks and Archimedes and, and Euclid and so on, and now we're going to fill in some gaps with Hilbert and Van Neumann and, uh, and others uh, as we go. And we'll alternate. We'll get back to, fi to formal language theory and complexity classes and other things. But I want to kind of mix it up for you a little bit so it's not just formal languages and grammars and Turing machines, but kind of show you the bigger picture. And, uh, and I, I think that's a good thing to, to be aware of and to know and uh, how, we, how we all got here uh, over the last couple thousand years. Uh, in terms of technology, science, axiomatic reasoning, logic, and the machines that we have today, the technology that we're all using, and is sitting in our pockets and driving us around and so on. All right, any, any thoughts, questions, comments? Um, so uh, we have a spring break coming up next week. Uh, I'm probably going to give an extension on the homework. Uh, the homework, the next homework was going to be due at the end of the vacation. But some people ask for extension, saying, you know, it's, so I'll probably give a few extra days, uh, whoever I'll send an announcement uh, by, uh, by email. Uh, but you'll have probably a little bit more time so that the homework is not due on, on, on the weekend of the vacation, the last weekend of the vacation. So, uh, but one of the things about the next homework, you've got to read, uh, finish reading um, Polya's How to Solve It. How many have read that or are well into it? Polya's How to Solve It, the book? Good. For the for the third homework, you, you need to finish that book because you get a lot of mileage out of that book. There's a lot of great problem-solving techniques, and if you save that to the last week of class, it, you're missing out because you can use all that knowledge throughout the class, right, the next couple of months. So, so that's why I'm having you read that early on rather than later. Uh, so. All right. Well, we'll see you then. <laughs>